Hey everybody, it's Wanda, and today we have a special guest with us, David Seltzer. He is from Azure Standard, and he's going to answer as many questions as I can think to ask him today. So David, uh, to start with, will you introduce yourself and kind of give them a, a history or something of why you started Azure, what Azure is? Oh my, that might uh, might be a little bit of a big ticket there for a history, but... Um, yeah, I'm David Stelzer. I've, um, my father started farming organically in 73, kind of way before it was cool. And so that, you know, Azure was, is, was kind of a byproduct of that. Originally, we, um, the first, oh, I don't know, 15 years or so, um, dad had a deal with uh, Bob Moore, which later became Bob's Red Mill. Mm -hmm. to supply all of their grain, organic grain. Uh, we ended up losing that contract in the mid 80s because not necessarily because of Bob, but because of the uh, supermarket conditions that were in place at that time. Um, so I went out and started looking for markets and uh, didn't really find a big one, but I found um, a lot of small ones. So we started, um, so I started doing deliveries. Originally, it was just in the back of the pickup um, and started making deliveries here in the Northwest. We're from Oregon, um, but not in Portland. We're in uh, North Central Oregon. Okay. And so we would make, I would make deliveries around to Eugene, Portland, Bend, Seattle, Yakima, Tri-Cities, um, doing um, our grain and flour and stuff that we grew on the farm. And um, pretty soon I realized that we kept having, it started out with some friends and family and word of mouth. People kept asking me to pick this up for them and pick up that for them. And so come about 1987, I realized there may be something to this. And so I, created a little tiny catalog of all the things that, um, you know, I had been asked for quite a bit. And that was kind of how, um, how Azure got started in a super short nutshell. Explain what Azure standard kind of what it is, because some people may be new. Um, we have only been, buying from Azure Standard a couple of months. We knew about it several years ago, and a lot of our friends in uh, homesteading groups ordered from Azure, but the thing was we had to drive about an hour or so uh, to the coast, and we live 30, 45 miles from the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and to get into that coast traffic and deal with it, we just didn't want to go to a big drop-off place. And I didn't realize it, but two years ago, they started a drop off that is in the other direction. It's, it takes us about 30 to 40 minutes to get there. And it's a small town, a small drop off with, you know, less than 20 people usually. So we started, like I said, three months ago, we're expecting our next order this weekend. And we have loved everything we've gotten so far. But can you tell them a little bit about Azure? what it is and exactly, you know, um, the pro not necessarily name the products, but what kind of products you carry. Azure has grown over the years from the, um, you know, grains and flowers and a few uh, staples to uh, pretty much we do um, it, full serve service in healthy foods. And so I, we have here at Azure, we have relationships with farmers, growers, um, manufacturers and processors from basically all over the world um, that have what we consider to be the healthiest, cleanest products that are on the market. Um, most of the products that are in our mix are organic, um, not 100%, but we try to go for the the healthiest and the cleanest, especially for the price point that that is available. Um, my, you know, as a farmer, and maybe you see this as a homesteader as well on the products that you actually produce, but a farmer most of the time 
um, they kind of hold out their hands both sides and say, how much do I have to pay for supplies, fuel, tractor, whatever? They hold out their other hand and say, how much will you pay me for whatever this thing is that I'm growing? And they have no control over either side of that. So the only thing they have control over is volume. We were, you know, before um, before Azure, we were caught in the same in the same bind. The what that does is it creates an environment that incentivizes the farmer to do sh shoddy quality because they're only paid for quantity; they are not paid at all for quality. So the mission that I that. <laughs> That, that I have had with Azure almost from the very beginning is to bridge that gap. Um, instead of saying, we want to connect the farmers that are willing to grow high quality products, nutrient dense, organic, chemical free, all the best with consumers that actually care about that. So there are, you know, there are a lot of consumers that care about what goes into their bodies. Uh, they care about the food that they eat. Um, and, you know, and there are farmers that love their soil and love their land and are willing to do it right. And this is the connection that Azure makes. And that's the primary goal. Uh, that is so, uh, what we liked about it, too, is that you guys have sort of kind of the same motivation as we do. We don't want chemicals in our soil at, at the least amount as we can do, you know, whatever we can get. I mean, I'm not saying we're 100% organic either, but um, we do it as much as we can without putting any type of chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, um, anything that would put some kind of chemical back in our soil. And so I understand where you're coming from. You you carry not only foods, but health, like health and beauty aids, chicken, uh, animal supplies, all kinds of things. And all of those are as organic as you can get them without chemicals and things. And, and uh, we'll right. talk. So, so if we're doing chicken feed, it's going to be, you know, organic grains. The things with conventional chicken feed, for instance, a lot of the grains are directly sprayed with glyphosate. Glyphosate is a herbicide that is very much linked to disease in humans. You you change that up and you've got you feed that to the animal and then you eat the animal, it's just that much more concentrated. So we're very careful with some of these feeds. We make sure that they are clean that they don't have a bunch of farm chemicals on them. And I don't even think we really sell any feeds that are not certified organic just because we don't want any of those kinds of, um, you know, we don't want any of those kinds of residues in our food, but, you know, starting at the very beginning, I mean, it's, it's not just about agricultural chemicals. Azure does not carry any foods with a wide variety of, of chemicals because it's, you know, agriculture is not the only user of chemicals by a large margin. Food processors use chemicals like crazy. I yes. mean, you look at uh, preservatives, dyes, colorings, um, sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors, all those things are being used by food manufacturers with impunity. In fact, you know, there's a lot of them that are even banned in other countries like Europe that uh, pays a little more attention to their science. You know, um, you know, red food dye that we use here in the U.S. and all the children's, you know, food is yeah. banned in Europe. Now, Azure wouldn't even, you know, wouldn't carry anything with any of those chemicals in it across the board. We have for years and years, we've made sure that our food is clean. There's nothing like, there's no artificial, you know, colors, preservatives, flavorings, sweeteners, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, and there's nothing that contains any genetically modified material. What percentage or what type foods would you grow on your farms? Does Azure own farms or are, are you just leasing out 
or just buying from farmers so that people have an idea of foods because you said the flowers and stuff you started out with y'all y'all grew the grain yourself so do you grow any of the We, products or absolutely, Azure is still, uh, we are still a farm. Um, we still farm about 4,000 acres, all of it certified organic. Um, of course, grain takes a lot of acres, um, but we do, so we have several lines that are ours. Um, the grain, um, we do some, most of the ancient grains is what we actually do the most now. Um, so uh, Coruscant, Spelt, Einkorn, uh, Heirloom Wheats. We have an Heirloom Soft White that we do. Um, and then we do a few of the grains like, you know, wheats and rice that we, that we rotate in. Um, so as far as the grains, the vast majority of the grain acres is dedicated to Heirloom now. Um, it's a lot easier to buy from other farmers wheat and rye and stuff like that than it is the heirloom type grains because not everyone knows how to grow that kind of stuff so we've dedicated most of our land to that we also uh, grow a lot of fruit um, so in the summer including right now you can buy uh, fruit that's azure we we label it as azure husbandry and we grow um, um, a lot of that we're The season's winding down a little bit. We still have a few apples and pears um, going through the system. Uh, then we also do uh, plants in the spring. We do what we call Ellie's Eden Garden Starts. That's actually grown on our farm. Mm -hmm. And we do also grow a lot of garden seeds on our farm. Um, we do, uh, you know, and some of that, a lot of that, we sell all those through Azure. We sell them other places some of these as well, um, just because it's easier to do a little more scale, but uh, <laughs> not with everything. Some of it we still do pretty by hand on some of the garden seeds. But. So y'all, y'all do plant starts in the spring. I mean, like little plants, like you can buy. In yep. The you can buy a little plant. So if you want to buy a lot of herbs, so if you want to buy, you know, stevia, thyme, lavender, any of that, but we also do tomatoes and peppers and, you know, um, cucumbers and all, all the, pretty much all that stuff. Um, but the, you know, we do a lot of hard to find, um, herbs that, you know, even, uh, one of our best sellers is comfrey of, yeah. you know, how it's super, super easy to grow, but it's something that every homestead should have if you're into natural medicine at all, but you only probably need one start and it'll be there for life. Uh, we have some comfrey that we got from a gentleman, um, gosh, eight or 10 years ago. And I still have a start of it and I keep it going and, and we use it chop and drop sometimes and just different things. You mentioned seeds. So now with the seeds, if people order, because I think I saw this in one, in one of the questions that people were asked, and I think I looked at the seeds, and I think they were unusual, not necessarily unusual seeds, but not what you would find on just any seed catalog out there. And it was... So we do, uh, yeah, we do 100% open pollinated seeds, yes. mostly heirloom. We don't do, we don't really do any hybrids to speak, you know, we do. So we have our seed line is under um, Azure Husbandry as well. And then we also carry two other seed lines of unusual. Uh, we call one's called Heirlooms Evermore and the other is Brim Seed. And so we carry both of those to fill in. Brim Seed is very specific for the South. Most of their seeds are, you know, highly, you know, varietals that they're from Texas and they do varietals that are specifically designed for the Southern tier. Um, uh, Heirlooms Evermore is more North. And of course we're up here in Oregon. So we're more Northern tier as far as the seeds that, that we grow. They're more um, suited for, Northern climes, although we sure do some whale of good watermelon for watermelon <laughs> seeds that would probably grow really good in the South. 
I but. found that, you know, even though uh, there are some things that we've ordered from companies, uh, seed companies in the years past that did okay down here and some that just don't, but we generally save our own seed. A lot of the seeds that we plant, we have saved, Danny saved some for at least 20 plus years. Uh, his corn seed, he's, he, say, he started that and, and bred up a corn that he calls Danny corn. He's had that okay. for 30 plus years and he still, we just grew some this year and just made cornmeal and grits. That's something I don't order from Azure because I have my own cornmeal and grits, but I did order some flour. Uh, I can't remember. I uh, maybe oat flour last time. This time I'm ordering, and I did order the just plain all purpose flour, I believe last time. This time I ordered one of the Unifine flowers and I think it was one of the ancient I don't remember which older grain that it was ancient grains uh could you explain between unifying because I was I'm, I'm totally into azure that's like my standard now for shopping and I go look at a lot plus you were on YouTube and you have ex explanations of um all these processes but I looked at the Unifine, I was reading up on that, and I was really interested because we do grind our own corn milling grits with a stone mill. And I know the first flour I got, I believe, was stone ground, if I if I remember correctly. But the one I'm ordering that comes in this weekend is the Unifine. So could you talk a little bit about that and the benefits of the Unifine versus stone ground or regular flours and stuff, the way they usually grind them? Yeah, so unifying, uh, and again, most of the unifying that we that we sell, that is run through our own mill. We have our own flour mill. Um, it is a unifying. So unifying, it's a it's a pro. It was originally invented around World War II time. In fact, there's a crazy story about that. The guy, it was a uh, invented in England, and his first mill got bombed by the Germans during World War II. Wow! And then, <laughs> then he the story. <laughs> Then he comes to the U.S. Anyway, he was able to get uh, Washington State University, WSU, to help him develop the mill. This is like back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. he, um, so they developed the mill. They actually built um, several prototypes. And um, uh, But the problem was in the 60s, um, they felt that it didn't have much economic benefit because you could not make completely white flour with it. Yep. <laughs> it's a, it's, you know, so what it does is it's a high, it's basically in a simplified form, it's a high speed rotor traveling very, very fast. Mm -hmm. The grain falls in and, and this rotor, it doesn't touch anything else there's what's called a rotor and a stator. They're about a quarter inch apart. They're not even super close together, but the grain falls in and it hits the rotor going at this high speed. Most of the time, the grain instantly just explodes because <laughs> of the impact. If it doesn't completely explode, it pushes it against the stator and then the stator finishes the process out it's only in this machine for half a rotation it doesn't even go down one rotation then it blows out up a up a tube and then um you know we drop it through a cyclone to get the flour out of that um that air so the 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 benefit to the unifying um, number one is when it explodes, it breaks. There is no cutting. There is no heat. There is no, the, the grain explodes in the places where um, the molecules are basically already uh, connected. So for instance, in a, in a steel mill, which the vast majority of flour is ground in steel mills, they're, um, they cut the grain. And when it's cutting the grain, it's cutting through that with basically a zillion, whole bunch of little cutting knives and into finer and finer and finer pieces. Mm -hmm. 
For instance, the oil molecules, like the wheat germ oil and that kind of thing, it, it will slice through those oil molecules and the flour will almost immediately, you have a certain amount of rancidity starting to happen. With the unifying, that is not the case. So if you're using a steel mill, you know, I tell people, hey, if you're using that kind of a thing, make sure you use the flour within 12 hours of when you grind it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. With the unifying, it explodes. It does not break the oil molecule. So the flour is not starting on a rancid journey right away. Stone ground is somewhere in the middle. So what it's doing, it's scrunching and crunching mm -hmm. the grain. So it's a heavy stone on, you know, or spring pressure or whatever, but basically a heavy stone on top of another stone. The flour goes through that um, or the grain goes through that. And as it's rubbing around on this stone, it does create quite a bit of heat because it's all friction and it's just grinding it. So it does not break as many molecules of the oils and stuff as the steel mill does, but it still does some because it's crunching and scrunching it. So it's bruising it basically. So it's bruising those oil molecules. So you, you know, and so again, if you have a stone mill, what stone mills are really good for is grits mm -hmm. so if you're gonna leave them uh, leave them so that they're not grinding a super fine flour the stone mill is the perfect um you know perfect option if you're doing grits whether it's corn grits or you're making polenta or um even you know cream of wheat type of grits um or you know corn meal even for that matter a stone mill is the right tool it's a great great option for that. When you're making fine flour, you're needing to bring that all the way down. To get it all the way down in a stone mill, you are going to create a lot of heat and a lot of friction. <laughs> and it's so the unifying is a much better option. The other thing that we can do with the unifying, we have what we call the ultra unifying. So basically with the unifying, because of the way it explodes the grain, it we can then sift out a certain percentage of the larger brand. So with the ultra unifying, what we've done is we take the unifying flour, which is very fine anyway, it's a very nice fine flour. And then we sift out any of the large pieces of brand. Now large is actually very small compared to other brand yeah. from a stone mill or something else, but we sift that out and so what it does, uh, ultra unifying flour almost acts like white flour because the reason whole wheat flour tends to make a little less leavened of a bread is because the bran punctures the air bubbles and allows some of the air bubbles to escape as bread is rising. So if we sift out all the large pieces of bran, we still have basically all the nutrients except maybe a little bit of the fiber, but it's the least important fiber because it's the biggest pieces. We digest the smaller pieces much better, but we still have all the vitamins, the vitamin E and all the nutrients of the, you know, of the whole grain, like whole, whole wheat type situation uh, without the large pieces of bran to puncture the bumble. So you get it acting like white flour doesn't look quite like white flour. It's going to be a little darker, but you get the action and the texture of white bread with the nutrients of whole grain bread. So I think in many ways, it's the best of both worlds. Well, for those I, that, learned, you know. I just learned about that this week. I had, I had made bread for many years and the past few years I haven't because my husband went gluten-free and we just quit making bread altogether and went into more of the corn and corn products than trying to deal with flours. And I did use some of the Bob's Red Mill and stuff like that. And I've tried alternative flowers and eventually it just wasn't worth the effort because it was so packy and it was crazy. And my bread was always hit and miss. Even when my kids were little, when I would make bread, some days it would be beautiful and some days it wouldn't be. And I didn't know the ins and outs. And one thing I learned, I think in the past two weeks, was what you just said about those larger pieces puncturing those bubbles that you were trying to create to make your bread pop up. You yeah, know? whether you're using sourdough, sourdough is a little bit more forgiving, but if you're using yeast or sourdough, either one, 
it's the same concept. You're creating little bubbles in there. The sourdough creates the little bubbles. The yeast creates little bubbles. You know, I think sourdough is a, you know, my favorite way to go, but yeah. um, it, it's the same basic concept either way. Well, that was one of the things I'm fixing to get back since being able to get from Azure. I, I think my husband is not allergic to wheat and stuff like that, but he was having an intolerance and probably to chemicals because he has an intolerance to anything that has chemicals in it. And so he pretty much eats what we grow. He has been leaning toward as I buy Azure, he is starting to eat a, a little bit more variety than things that we just grow because I'm buying from Azure and he trusts Azure as far as the chemicals and the way you guys um, vet every item and make sure that there's it's some nothing is grown in the wrong way or nothing has had, like you said, the chemicals added, like the red dyes and all the other weirdnesses they think of to throw in there and well there's actually thousands of those items yes. that are approved by the fda unfortunately fda is really quick to go grass or generally recognized as safe with yes. food chemicals um even though you know they they're so worried about the slightest bacteria they make you pasteurize everything but boy put those chemicals in there that's all that's all good yeah, well, that was the thing we we have been watching since he started having issues about eight years ago. We had went down rabbit trails all over the place. And so one of the things that we found from Azure was the oats. Now, I love the um, old fashioned oats. Uh, I've ordered them every time I ordered big bags. I haven't ordered the biggest bag you have, but I ordered a big bag each time. And um he eats a lot of oatmeal. He loves his oatmeal. And he had called Quaker and asked them about the oats one day. And he kept asking them about chemicals. And if he asked, does it have this? They would say no. Well, then when he would research it and he would look at that word, it had like 50 words that meant the same thing. So he would call them back and he would ask, does it have this? And they would say no. And when he finally started running the words, one word would pop up and they go, well, yes, it has that. And he said, but don't you realize I've asked you about all these other words. They're all the same. And they said, well, you didn't ask us about this word. You asked us about all these other words. And our answer is no, but they have to answer yes on the, the one, whatever the word of the day is, I guess, for that chemical. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. And so he was really outdone with Quaker Oats and, so when the, my very first order, I, I put on there, I think a pound or something of oats. And he says, you better get more than a pound. And I said, okay, I'm going to get, I think it was five pounds or 10 pounds, whatever the next size up. Five was. probably, yeah. And uh, I told him, I said, okay, I'm going to do that. And he almost ate the whole five pounds in one month. And so probably this next order, I order that many every month. So the next order is going to be a bigger pack and I vacuum seal the extra so that I don't have um, a big thing. I know a lot of people ask, that's one question I was going to ask about how, because I watched you and your wife, how y'all um, store some of your foods and stuff. And y'all have some really great storage ideas on one of your um, YouTube videos, I believe on storage containers. I mean, I've not ordered any containers and I think you carry them at Stat Azure and you can mention that in a minute. But um, we vacuum seal in bags, some of it Mylar, some of it um, just vacuum seal bags. But the oats was a really great thing. The cheese, uh, I love that it didn't have any colors and additives and stuff in the cheese. The cream cheese, uh, I can't remember the name, Gina something, I think was a cream cheese. Oh, yeah. Amazing. I have not tasted cream cheese that was that really, like, perfect. And I added it to my hot pepper jelly, so it was fantastic. And um, I'm trying to think. We uh, The onions, the fresh sweet onions. Now, I don't know who grows your sweet onions, but the the first couple of things that we got of, of the onions were so sweet and so, it's, I mean, just perfection. And we just sit and eat them raw. And then the second 
we got were really sweet, but had a touch of that hot to them. So I know it's soil and things like that. So could you explain that too, as you talk about some of these products? Yeah, some of that is varietal as well. So Mm-hmm. it's soil type, you know, though out here we have, um, you've heard of the Walla Walla sweet onion, right? Mm-hmm. Walla Walla is just a, a, just a short distance from where we're at. It's in Okay. Washington, but it's just barely across the border. Um, and our soil type here is called Walla Walla silt loam. So our soil type is the same as Walla Walla, where the famous sweet onion came from. We don't actually raise the onions on our farm. They're in a neighboring farm, another farmer that we know that raises the onions. But the thing about the different varieties of sweet onions, the Walla Walla onion doesn't keep very long. It's a very short keeper. So we ra- that is raised in the summer, and it's a very sweet onion and doesn't have much bite to it. So the Walla Walla will be first. We'll start harvesting Walla Wallas by, say, mid-July around here. And that will we'll be able to, or maybe even earlier, um, over in the basin. And then, you know, we can, you know, those will be good till maybe the middle of August. Then we'll have to go into different varietals of sweet onions. Mm -hmm. And the different varietals, the, the later we get for the sweet onions, probably the more bite they're going to have just because of the way the varietals work. You're in like a Walla Walla, you plant that thing when it's still really quite chilly. I mean, I know down in the South, you guys have different weather, but uh, here we're planting the, the Walla Wallas when it, you know, it's still freezing at night. It's fine. They do just fine like that. And then, you know, um, so they're growing in very cool temperatures So that's the difference really between the bite as the, as we, as the season progresses and you're getting onions that are growing more over the heat of the summer, because it can get, you know, it can get warm out here. Um, You know, it can get to a hundred degrees Fahrenheit on a super hot day here. Um, It, the, you know, it gives a little, little bit more of a bite to the onion. I thought that might be it too. Um, We are just, Now fixing to, and and I think in November is when we put our onions in the ground. And so we grow over the winter, but our coldest, we seldom drop into the twenties. Very, very seldom. Uh, The thirties is, is usually our lowest 27 on a really cold day. Now we might have a week that might drop down towards zero for a day or two, or maybe even four or five days once or twice a winter, but our temperatures on average are above 25 all the time. And our, you know, and like now it dropped down into the low fifties last night, but during the day it's up high eighties, sometimes bumping nineties, two, three. And that throws our heat index because we are close to the uh, Gulf coast. Um, We have a lot of humidity. And our humidity stays anywhere from 68 to 100% humidity all the time, usually in the high 60s, 70s, most all the time. So it keeps our heat index up there. And so we grow our onions throughout the winter and harvest in the spring. And that's when you probably are just getting yours ready going in the ground. But Yeah, I'm glad. see, if if we let them go over the winter, so if we plant them like now, they'll go, well, it would be too late. They would die if we planted them now. But if we say planted them in August, mm-hmm. we would get an onion about so big. Um, <laughs> and they would then go dormant over the winter, kind of, and they would go immediately to seed in the spring. Yeah. So that's that's how we would get seed onions. And we actually grow onion seed. That's one of the things we wow. do. So the onions that we're actually growing for seed, we do plant in August. You don't need a huge bulb to no. grow seed. So we plant them late, let them go over, in, and then they winter over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's more to do with the light than the temperature. You know, yeah, you say you get be. a week as, you know, we don't get a we're not super cold here either. In fact, I can probably count on one hand all the years that I've, you know, 50 years that I've been here that we've actually hit zero. 
It's wow. very, very seldom, but we do have, you know, Oregon is known for extremely long springs and falls and relatively short winters and summers. So we, yeah. we have, uh, ours is, I think ours is relatively long summers, almost all year round with an occasional bout of winter. Occasionally, we might get a little bit of spring and a touch of fall, but ours is summer almost year-round, seems like. <laughs> but, well, hey, uh, there's, a, there's ask, advantages and disadvantages, oh, I guess, yeah, to, to all of that. But. Pluses and minuses. But on your products, now you do get some from overseas because I've gotten the olive oil and uh, I believe the Medi Mediterranean, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember for sure. Yep. Um Amazing because we were looking, and the other was the apple cider vinegar. Um, we apple were, cider vinegar is not from overseas, that is domestic. No. In fact, we've even sold some of our apples to that vinegar plant, the ones that are that yeah. are making it. The the vinegar, the apple cider vinegar is made actually here in Idaho. The right. best vinegar maker that I'm aware of, he's been doing it for generations. They've been well, making the, vinegar. The products, uh, like the uh, olive oil. We had been looking for a really good olive oil. And when mine came, they had packaged it with some cold stuff and um, not frozen stuff, but just some some things that were yeah. cold. And so my olive oil was in that box. And when I took it out, it had solidified, you know, and I'm like, oh, wow, olive oil, that's real olive oil. <laughs> I said, that's amazing. But yeah, real I, olive oil, if you if you get it down below like 40 degrees, <laughs> it will solidify just like coconut oil yes. and, you know, partially solidify, you get a little colder, it'll all the way solidify. Mm -hmm. um, our olive oil is actually from Tunisia okay. um, on the Southern bank of the Mediterranean. And I, you know, I've gone all over the world looking for the best olive oil. I've actually visited our, I've personally visited our olive oil farm oh, because wow. I feel like olive oil is such an important fat. Um, of all the oils, I'm not a big, you know, we carry all the different oils, mm -hmm. pretty much the best version of the organic oils, including things like sunflower and safflower oil. Mm -hmm. But the very important oils, the, the most important oil, in my opinion, is olive oil. It should be the go-to fat. Uh, and then coconut oil probably is the second most important. So the olive oil, I actually, and it's also very common. Mm -hmm. I actually had a, uh, you know, a colleague that I know down in Northern California. They went and just bought olive oil off the supermarket shelves all over California, like 15 different, different brands, and had them all lab tested for yes. purity. Mm -hmm. And out of the 15 that were on the shelf in California supermarkets, only three were not diluted with other oils. Yeah. Unfortunately, finding, yeah. the olive oil industry um, leaves a little bit to be desired in their, um, their honesty and uh, integrity. First, we were going to Greece and Italy for trying to find olive oil. So I went to Italy as well. I did not trust that. I ended up in Tunisia at a company that does, I mean, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and they grow olives. I don't know if anyone's ever, you know, if any of you have ever been to Tunisia, almost the whole country's covered with olives. Wow. It's like, it's the thing in Tunisia and it's pretty dry. So the olives are grown without irrigation, but they're, the trees are really far apart. So it gives the roots a long ways to go. It's not like dense olive oils like you'd see in like Spain or something. Yeah. And not saying there's not some companies that do. I found some unique olive oils that are very good from Spain as well. There are some good Spanish olive oils. Um, but these, you know, these trees are producing what they actually produce naturally. So they're almost, they're planted, but it's almost like wild olives, the way that they're grown in Tunisia. So it's really fun to, to do that. And then they don't grow any other oil. So they would have to actually import something to dilute it with, right? Yeah. They're, you know, that's their, uh, you know, 
you know, they can't grow canola or safflower or anything in, you know, in Tunisia. So, you know, there's less uh, opportunity or, or um, temptation to try to dilute oils. So well, they don't. Right. And, um, you know, and I feel they, that's pretty good integrity with the, with the. And they're not sourcing it out that as long as they're not sourcing it out to other co countries or, no, you know, we're, we're directly, house, that makes yeah, we're directly importing it from the pressing plant in Tunisia. Okay. Um, okay so the, the apple cider vinegar, we briefed on this one. Um, I used to use a popular brand and, uh, I actually had some on my shelf, several bottles of it for, you know, just prepping purposes and because we use, use it regularly. And when I got my Azure, I, I bought a gallon and it was 6%. And I'm like, yes, because other things on the store shelves are dropped down now to 4%. And a lot of your, um, recipes when you're making something says it should be five percent or better in order to um yeah you do have to be a little bit careful with some of the pickle recipes and such because a yeah. lot of them are made for five percent so yeah. use a little less yes. um and you can do the math it's easy math but our you know vinegar in in as it's naturally produced organic apple cider vinegar comes out at between six and six point two so we get the undiluted real stuff exactly like it's made when it's, you know, Braggs or somebody, they go and they dilute it to 5%. And then now, like you mentioned, some of them are deleting it all the way to four. Yes. And so it's not, it's just not as effective. You're buying a lot more water like Braggs, for instance, when Patricia Bragg was alive mm -hmm. and running the company, Bragg's vinegar was the very best. The funny thing is they bought it from the same plant we buy ours from. Wow. <laughs> Patricia Bragg did. As soon as she lost control of the company, mm -hmm. um, because I think, you know, Patricia actually cared. Yes. When she lost control of the company, they immediately quit buying. I know this because I've talked to them, you know, man, many times I've been in the plant. Um he, they quit buying. He got left kind of how holding the bag because he was producing a lot of vinegar for her, for Bragg's actually, yes. um, because they could find it cheaper imported from um, South America. So they started importing their, you know, so the Bragg's is now imported from South America and gone through the dilution plants. Yes. And that's, you know, that's what they're now selling with the same label that what used to be the best vinegar on the market had on it. And so now if you want that vinegar, um, you can still get it. You can still get the real stuff, but you're going to have to get, you know, either ours or there's only one other brand actually that is on the market that. Uh, well, I use it every day. I drink some and, you know, like you said, you just learn to dilute it. You learn how much you want uh, per day in your glass or whatever, and for the pickles and things, but at least you've gotten the good stuff. You have a good vinegar and price wise. I know this was one of the biggest things that I had several, I've had several people mention it. It's too expensive to do Azure. And I price checked a lot of your products just because, and I found that you were eat, usually under some of them, because when you do organic oats and you buy a five pound bag, I think, I think the bag was eight something. I don't even remember right off, but I looked on Amazon. I looked on Walmart and, and in grocery stores and stuff to get a five pound bag of organic oats was way more than $8. <laughs> I was like, so, and I did the the vinegar. I priced it. I priced uh, some of the butters with the without the R, R B S T whatever that is. I don't know. I mean, Danny knows what it is, but I don't. R B S T. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a genetically modified hormone that's yeah. used. Um, you price that as opposed to what you get in the grocery stores. You're right there at it. The um, and I found that your incentives, like your um. Uh, your 
I don't I don't remember how, what it's called, but like Azure times two or Azure Azure times Cash, we call Azure it, yeah. Cash. Yes, that ends up putting my um, um, shipping because like last month my shipping was uh, I think it was sixteen or eighteen bucks, something like that, on way more products than I would ever get shipped to my house uh, because I was getting it through the the truck. Uh, I think it was eighteen dollars, and yeah, it's eight point five percent going to um, basically to east truck. of the Rockies. On the Yeah. west coast, we don't charge shipping at all, but on the east side, you know, because of the extra transport cost, we did a to just make it simple. We just do an Yes. eight point five percent. But with the Azure Cash, I think I got eleven dollars back. Yeah. So my my shipping was like less than seven or eight bucks for all these products that I got. Granted, I had to go meet the truck, but it's a day out for me. And if I was going shopping, I would have to go to the store. And as it was the last time, there was some products left on the truck, and uh, I got to get honey and um, more cheese, um, more oats. all kinds of things. And I got to try the uh, fig bars and chocolate and things that I wouldn't have just ordered uh, with the fig bars and the chocolate. I wouldn't have ordered that possibly because I wouldn't have known, but the fig bars tasted like the old fig mutants. I was so totally surprised. And I'm like, okay, finally a product that tastes like without all the chemicals, you know, and We, we had several people asked about that. So I want you to tell us about the uh, products that are left on the truck that somebody did not pick up. They were worried that somebody was out of money. They ordered this and they didn't pick it up. And I, and I tried to explain that you do refund their money minus 10%, I believe is how it's worded. Yeah, it's a, you know, we try to have as little of that as we possibly can. We we encourage everyone to pick their orders up. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, we will get something, um, and it's not frequently, but we will have somebody that, you know, will try to cancel their order after it's already shipped or something like that. Or they just flat don't show up. The driver can't get a hold of them. We usually try to call if people don't show up. They don't answer. Eventually, you know, we the driver has to leave. We have them, we have them on a relatively um, strict schedule. Yes. There are some drop point coordinators that actually will hold orders, but not everyone is able to do that. Um, so if something gets left on the truck, you know, we don't want it to go to waste. So we just let people um, buy it off the truck at usually a pretty steep discount, more than the 10% that we don't refund to the people who didn't. you know, that canceled their order, didn't pick it up. Um, so we usually give uh, some sort of a discount just to get um, folks to buy that off, off the truck. And, you know, it's, it's just so it doesn't go to waste because the way that our model works on the East, you know, East coast or the East side, we call it, I know you guys don't consider yourself East coast, but to us, it's like, you know, Eastern <laughs> Eastern United States. Southern So, Eastern, I guess. Southeastern. yeah, yeah, you're down in the Southeast. But what we do, the drivers that go on these routes, they never come back here. I shouldn't say never, but very, very seldom ever come back here to the warehouse. What we do is we ship, we call them shuttles. So we'll sh fill a truck here. And the timing for this is, is impeccable. Uh, it doesn't always work a hundred percent, but mostly it does. But we, we run the shuttle out and they meet the delivery truck. So the delivery driver, all he does is deliveries. He isn't driving near as many miles, but he's making deliveries every, and it's a very different, you know, it's a different kind of a driver that drives for 10 miles, gets out, unloads a thousand or two pounds, gets in, drives another 10 miles or 15 miles and does it, you know, and unloads it. When he's empty, we have another truck waiting for him. So then they, we, we transload those trucks and the, you know, most of the drivers, a lot of them will do um, anywhere from 
two or two or three trucks a week, um, loads a week that they deliver. And we have the shuttles waiting for them each time they get empty. And, you know, and since we're running clear across the country in some cases or nearly across, um, you know, that's all speculative timing. So we might have, you know, we might have two trucks en route for one truck if we're going to the, you know, uh, far edges of the country like Florida or Maine or, you know, the, the eastern seaboard. So because of that, the truck that the shuttles and delivers doesn't always have a backhaul from Azure. We don't necessarily refill every one of those trucks. Some of them are, are just, com, you know, they're common carriers, but ones that we have relationships with. Yeah. And we let them get their own loads back, whatever they, they can haul. So there's no way we can really get the product back again if somebody returns it or, or can't take it. So that's why we um, you know, are trying to get that sold off the truck, as you mentioned. Oh, I ended up with, I mean, I ended up with the two blocks of cheese, and it was the white cheddar that I liked. I ended up with maple syrup, and I love mm -hmm. maple syrup. Even though we make our own cane syrup, Danny loves the cane syrup, and I will, I eat it occasionally, but if I want something, I want maple syrup. So they had maple syrup, and like I said, I got the raspberry blossom honey, I believe. Oh, so nice. I had some really good products. Somebody ordered really well, I can say. <laughs> okay. Well, so, I'm sorry they uh, didn't get it, but yeah, sometimes yeah. that. Um, okay, so one of the things I was going to ask about for sure was you repackage. So I'm assuming y'all have a whole repackaging warehouse or something. I think I read about that a little bit. Um, can you explain a little bit about buying in bulk, you buying in bulk in order to repackage it down where I get a gooder, a gooder, I get a better <laughs> discount <laughs> because I couldn't buy in bulk like you do to get the prices in order for me, like the oats. I get five pounds of oats for eight something. Um, but you get your oats in huge quantities coming in and then you repackage and you do a lot of your own I'm, a, I'm guessing we, you have the whole facilities to repackage. We do. We have several, actually. Um, <laughs> main difference being gluten and gluten-free, because mm -hmm. we do have that allergen element. We also have uh, other allergen elements as well. You know, dairy um, is the other big one. Um, but um, all the allergens we do separately. You know, some of them we do large quantities of gluten and um, allergen free are the two big ones. Yeah. And so we have a facility, actually, our primary packaging facility is still here in Dufer. Our warehouse is in Morrow. It's about 51 miles apart, the two buildings. Mm -hmm. And we shuttle roughly three loads. So the, the gluten facility is actually over by where the mill is. So we have that in, in the mill, same building that we have the mill in. And so, um, yeah, so if we're talking about, it depends what we're talking about. If we're talking about grain like wheat that we're going to make into flour, that comes in, you know, big hopper trailers. And we unload it. We have our own clean grain cleaning facility and everything. Um, you know, if it's something that we don't do that with, it could come in probably like super sacks. The oats would be a case where it would probably come in the super sack. So we would get a truck loader, you know, a semi load at a time of regular rolled oats, organic regular rolled oats, all in, in super sacks, which with oats, I think they're about 1800 pounds in a tote. Um, and then, you know, we will... We have a, in our facility, we have a little crane that picks the totes up. We set them up on a deck. The crane picks it up from there with a forklift. And then it picks it up from there, drops them into this hopper, and it goes over a volumetric filler. So then we fill the bags um, typically with a volumetric filler. 
of of some um i don't know if you know what a volumetric it basically is an auger that makes the exact number of rotations yeah. based on how much needs to go in there um the larger bags we do on scales so we actually built some of our own baggers and in in our warehouse they are our packaging facility at the mill they call them the llamas because <laughs> they they have this big tank on the back and then there's a, at an angle, there's a um, auger that goes up at an angle through that and goes out the top. And then the head is the, is actually a scale and a, um, a bagging mechanism. So on those, they, and this we use a lot for the larger bags, like 25 pounds or 50 pound bags. So then we'll slip the, the bag over the nozzle, it pinches it, we hit a button, it drops 25 pounds in there, we put the bag off, slip the next one on, hit the butt, hit the button, it goes, drops 25 pounds, and that's all weighed, that's on a scale. Yeah. So, you know, and heck, and then there's some things that we still do the old fashioned way and dip them at, or, uh, by hand. There <laughs> are, have you ever, you know, I don't, at this point, I know of no good machinery to dip papaya spears. I just <laughs> don't think it exists. So we're still doing things like that by, you know, that is being done by hand in what we call our dip room. So in, in our warehouse over in Moro, because that's not, that would not be a gluten allergen. They would do that by basically by hand in the dip room away from any other allergens, opening those, um, you know, mangoes or papayas or, you know, there's quite a few things. Um, and then they do that by hand and put them in the bags. So with the, with that being said, the, um, two things that I know I've noticed people commenting on, one of them was the canned, like, peas, corn, and things like that. And they're saying, but they're in aluminum cans. There is a coating inside those cans, I'm assuming. So they're not They're not aluminum. Those are steel yeah. cans. Uh, yes, explain exactly on that so that, that my viewers will know because I ordered the, some English peas and some corn to test this time. Mm -hmm. um, we usually yeah. grow all our English peas and all our corn, but for like my my subscribers and stuff, I want to be able to taste it and see if it passes my taste test and stuff so that my subscribers would know, okay, this can of corn is good to stack on your shelf. This can of uh, English peas is good to go on your shelf. But that the one thing was I saw a lot of people saying the aluminum. All the beans and vegetables and all the stuff that we do with our label on it, none of it comes in aluminum. It yeah. all comes in steel cans with a porcelain lining. So it's a very, very thin porcelain lining. Yes. Okay. Um, and that's the way that those those all are set up. We don't do any, uh, um, no, no aluminum. That's- <laughs> I couldn't see y'all doing aluminum, but I, I was gonna ask that. We, and the other thing is the, um, the produce, like the onions and things. Uh, I got a heads up from the um, drop coordinator she told me that, she said, when you get your onions, she said, make sure you take them out of the plastic bag so that they don't start going bad. She said, they send them in plastic bags, but take them out. So is that something that you would recommend on all your produce? Because I wouldn't want my no, onions. No, not all the produce. Onions, unfortunately, we, you know, we put those in a plastic bag. We should not put onions in a plastic bag, but we do it because if we don't, Onions will smell up the oats exactly. that's in the same box in the truck. So we've learned. So we do say, yes, take your onions out. They need to breathe better. Um, they should be, you know, take them out. That's, I always have, I kind of have this thing about people use it, doing fruit bowls because they'll put, you know, peaches or cherries in their fruit bowl. Bad idea. That needs to be in the fridge. But onions are perfect for your fruit bowl, right? <laughs> That's that they need, they like air. Yeah. Um, so, yes, take your onions out. Um, a, a lot of our produce we pack in such a way that you can keep it in the package uh, to some degree. But, you know, uh, 
always, you know, take care of produce quickly. You know, it's not made, you know, we send you a box of cherries. It's not made to sit out in the counter for six hours before it gets put in the fridge. They, you know, we don't have a peel or anything like that. There's no preservatives. This is real fruit, just the way it was picked out of the field. And so, you know, there's some things that'll last longer than others. You know, apples will last longer, but even apples, if you don't take care of them, get them refrigerated right away. You put them in that fruit bowl at room temperature after they've been refrigerated for two months, keeping, you know, nice and crisp, they'll get mealy pretty fast. Yes. You want to keep those, those refrigerated if you possibly can. We highly recommend, you know, handling the produce as quick as you possibly can and getting it into, you know, appropriate climate. Yes, onions like, you know, <laughs> they're, they like a, a warmer climate. They can handle that. Gets too warm, they'll grow out, but that's mm -hmm. the worst that'll happen. But you don't want, you know, if the apples get warm over a little period of time, they'll start getting mealy and mushy. I've been watching for the apples uh, for a month. And when I saw on, uh, on Facebook, you guys have a Azure National, I think maybe, I don't know if that's the name of the, the group, but I, I, it's, an, it's for everybody all over the United States to join that group, ask questions and things like that. And then I have on Facebook my drop group so that when my coordinator sends messages in the Facebook drop group. I know that's just for my, my group, you know, but the national one, you can get ideas and recipes and, and, and people ask questions and answer questions all day long on all sorts of subjects and all things Azure. And I love that about it. Plus you have the YouTube channel and I didn't realize your YouTube channel been going for a while. I only saw a few of the recent ones. And then when I started going back, you've been doing some for quite a while. So if people have questions, you are answering a lot of the questions about Azure in on your YouTube channel, I think. Yeah, we've tried. We've tried to get as much information out on the YouTube channel as we possibly can. But, you know, there's always there's always new things. Yes. Uh, do you have anywhere else that you, um, I know you have the sale catalog. That was one thing. Somebody was asking about a bargain bin. Now, I don't know if you have a bargain bin, but I know when I go on, I check the sale items plus the catalog that comes. And um, I can't, I, but somebody asked, is there a bargain bin? <laughs> so, yes, uh, we used to call it bargain bin. Now we call it clearance. So if you go on the website and you go to shop and you click clearance, there's uh, what we call, what we used to always call bargain bin items, and they're distressed merchandise of some sort. Yeah. So it could be, um, there could be a damage, it could be bad labels. I mean, right now we've got um, um, monk fruit erythritol at, you know, because it says one pound on an eight ounce package, they misprinted it. So you got, you know, instead of throwing all that away, yes. um, we put it in and we just tell you. So if you click on the, says, the package says one pound, the content in the product is eight ounce. Servings and container are referenced on the website. So don't pay attention to the servings per container. Um, and so there's nothing else wrong with it. It's, but we're given 20% off if yeah. you'll use up those packages so we don't have to dump them out and put them in other packages. And so I like the fact that on your website, each item has so much information because when I would go in the grocery store and you pick an item up, the writing is so small on each item that you don't, you can't really read a whole lot, but on Azure, each item, you have a whole list country of origin you have any information that anybody would be asking questions about is there. You can spend on one item. You can read all kinds of information. And that is a big plus to me because my husband and I do read labels and we, mm -hmm. we are bad about it and we want to know what's in it and what's not in it and the reasoning. And, and you answer all that on the website. And I love that about each item too. 
plus how many you can get. You can get singles. You can, like if the cans of peas, you can get one can of peas. You can get a six pack or you can get a case. So, Case of and 12, with the flour yeah. is the same way. You have a small portion. If you can't, for people that can't afford 25 pounds of flour or don't need 25 pounds of flour a month, you can get a smaller portion, one pound or five pounds or whatever it comes in in the small portions. Yeah, so we try to do various sizes for, you know, um, when we're repackaging, Because, you know, as you pointed out earlier, we're buying it in huge totes and repackaging a lot of stuff, almost all the stuff that has our label on it, with the exception of those canned peas and stuff. Those were not. But um, the, um, the, the thing is that it's not really that much more of a problem to put it in the smaller bags. It's just it just costs more. Yes. And so we want to give. you know, a better price. So the smaller size per pound or whatever, you're paying a little bit more. So anyone who has a larger family or, you know, cooks at home or has a pantry, you can actually save some money by buying the 25 pound bag of flour or oats or whatever, instead of the five pound or the 21 ounce, uh, which is the small trial bag. But who, you know, we don't want to tell people, hey, you can't, um, You know, you got to buy 25 pounds and to try it, you know, Yeah. you can buy a 21 ounce for a few bucks and try it and know exactly, hey, is this is this the thing? And then next time you can go in and buy the, you know, buy the case. So. I tried the uh, sugar the first time too, and we love the sugar. Like I say, we raise our own sugar cane and we make our own cane syrup, but we, you know, it's a process to make sugar. So when I got my sugar, I was like hooked on it. It has that sweet cane taste. Most people don't even know what cane tastes like because they're used to the bleached white sugar. And I put it in everything. I've used it in everything. I know a lot of people say because it's bigger grains, they didn't like it. They're used to that really fine white powdered stuff. Um, I call it powdered stuff after seeing this. But I've learned that it, it it seems to melt really easily and fast. And all my stuff, I didn't notice a grainy taste to my anything that I've added it to. Um, but I guess if you were adding it for like making cake icing or something, it might not melt as well or as fast. But I add it to all products, everything I make. And I love the cane sugar. And yeah, I bought... to 25 pound bags and we'll be probably next month buying another one because we keep enough when my my fruit comes in i take and do um sugar a light syrup on everything so i go through a lot of Okay. sugar at different times of the year Yeah, no, if you're doing your own canning, um, you know, that makes a lot of sense with the sugar or the honey for that matter. I mean, some folks like to can with honey or, um, to make that syrup uh, as well. So uh, we do, I mean, if you want honey, we have the five gallon bu buckets, even um, if you want to save a little bit of money on that. So, you know, however, however it works out. okay um finally there's a only a couple of things i wanted to touch on right quick and one of them is do you carry the um storage bins that i saw you and your wife had We I've do. not really looked into that yet on azure Yes, we carry all the bins that we um, that we highlighted in the in the pantry video. Um, so we have all the way, you know, we Asher has its own line of glass canning jars. So we put a line of glass canning jars together. They also double really well as storage jars. So you can get including like the half gallon jars. And then we also have glass jars that with the wide mouth, they're not Azure branded per se, but they're gallon jars. Um, I call them milk jars because, you know, a lot of folks buy them for putting milk in that have their own, you know, Yeah. cows or whatever. And we have those in one gallon and half gallon size with the same lid. They're just shorter or taller. And so those are very popular pantry storage for the smaller stuff. Then we have the buckets. We have like the uh, 
the the two gallon gamma bucket and a gamma seal lid to fit that. And those we use in our personal pantry a lot. Um, those are kind of our go-to for everything that's not, you know, really small stuff like spices and stuff goes in the canning jars. Any so the next size up is the gammas. And then the things we use a lot of, we put in a five gallon pail with a gamma lid. So we have the larger gamma lids. A gamma lid is basically a lid that you clamp onto the five gallon pail, but the middle screws out. So you can screw the middle out so it's easy access. And the gamma lid though has a seal. So it still seals it tight. So it keeps moisture and insects and things like that out. Yes, um, that's what I was thinking. I knew the lids were different because I hate trying to open a plastic pail where you've got to pull the sides all the way around. I, I have problems with my wrist and that makes it very difficult for me to open something up and then to close it back. And I love those uh, five gallon buckets. And the, you said you had the smaller ones too, right? Yeah, the two gallon and the five gallon. And okay. then we also have a three and a half, but the three and a half is fits the same gamma lid that the five gallon fits. Mm -hmm. And then the two gallon fits a little smaller gamma lid. We have both available on the Azure site. And the other thing we do have is the Mylar bags. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are you know, vacuum packing stuff, we do have Mylar bags available and there's oxygen absorbers as well if you want to you know, keep something super dry that you know, that works pretty, pretty well. Um, but you know, at our house, we very seldom use the Mylar bags, you know, because we just dump them in the in the pails mm -hmm. and keep them that way because it's just so much easier access. You don't have to open the Mylar bag and reseal it and all that. Um, so we just use we use the pails, although, you know, we use Mylar bags even at Azure on some of our spices and herbs, especially medicinal herbs. We actually put them in Mylar bags on purpose because it's the best way to keep those kind of like medicinal herbs. So if you were to buy, you know, burdock root or something from Azure, it would, should come in a Mylar bag, yes. uh, you know, sealed up that way. Well, David, I want to thank you for coming and, and visiting with us because we had so many questions, but I want to end with you talking about Azure for just a minute, what they have to do in order to be, be a part of Azure. Um, it, it's free. I mean, it don't cost them anything to sign up, um, but talk a little bit about the ordering process and the truck and give them an idea of that part of it before we in today yeah so um at, at azure what is we have created a more efficient delivery model instead of you know shipping it like ups or something uh, and then we couldn't do like perishables and stuff at all um, over the years we've developed a delivery model where we send the product on our own trucks into local communities all over the country. So the idea is we don't necessarily do the last mile. And in the case of Wanda, it sounds like it might be more like 30 miles, but we don't do, uh, because she lives out in the middle of nowhere, you know, which is a good thing. Um, but we don't do that last mile because that is the very expensive part, but we deliver into the local communities all over. So there are around the country, we have what we call drop points. And usually there's a drop point coordinator that, um, that manages that drop point, And they're just volunteers. They're not Azure employees. They're, you know, have no um, affiliation with Azure except as volunteers to manage the local drop points so that good food can be brought into their communities. And then um, the truck, uh, then you can place your order online or over the phone. We do it both ways. We still have, I mean, we were from before the days of internet. So we have paper catalogs. So you can get paper catalogs. You mentioned the sale flyer, but we actually have actual catalogs as well. It's not one catalog because we broke it up by category. So we have like an outdoor catalog, a food catalog, a supplement catalog, um, things. Can they request um, those? 
you can yeah. request those. Um, you're welcome to go, you know, give us a call or go to the website. <clears throat> you know, um, we'll send out a free set of catalogs if you want paper. <clears throat> or um, if you are in the modern age and 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 the website's uh, easy to navigate. Uh, we try to keep it as easy as possible. We have all the long descriptions. Unlike the paper catalogs, we have a lot more information on the website available. Um, and so you can set up your account on the website, or if you want to do, we still have a call uh, center. So you can call us up and place orders or set up accounts over the phone as well. Either way, yeah, it's perfectly fine. And then, and then you go on and on the website and you can look at it on our website. Currently, there's a little link in the footer that says find a drop. That'll pull up a map. And on that map is little blue dots for every drop. And then you can zoom in to your local area or you can type your zip code into the little search bar and it will find the closest drop to, to you. And, um, and and then you can zoom out a little bit and see all the other drops that are in the general vicinity or anywhere in the whole country for that matter. And so we have, you know, Azure has, and these are all, you know, and if you click on one of those blue drops, it will tell you the drop manager's name and or email. Some mm -hmm. of them give the location of the drop, some do not. That's completely up to the drop coordinator. Some feel uncomfortable for the whole world knowing, especially if it's at their home or their church. Um, some will say, oh, it's at the Grange Hall. Nobody cares. That's where the drop is. They'll just say that. Um, but some, you know, especially if, you know, if they accept the drop at their home, a lot of times they will. Um, so we, it'll give you the general vicinity within a mile or so of where that's at, but not the exact address. If you email or call the drop coordinator, um, um, they'll, you know, give you that last and last piece of information if it doesn't say that. Uh, then otherwise, you just place your order either on the phone or on the website. And when you go to check out on the website or over the phone, you just tell folks or they'll help you. Um, just choose what drop you want to go to. And that will attach that to your account. And that will become the drop point for that order. And you can even have more than one if you prefer, you know, want to go to one one time and a different one another time. It allows you to have multiple drops as well. So the that's, one thing uh, I liked was the that you get emails from Azure uh, telling you the that your closeout day is your, you know, when they're going to the cut. Stop yeah, the cutoff day because the cutoff you day, know they give you with, a couple of days notice, and then from there you end up. Uh, I usually check out pretty early in the month. I go ahead and place my regular items and check out. And they don't charge your account till it's on the truck coming this way, I guess is the best That's way. That's right. To get. We, don't, we don't charge it until we actually ship it. So that yes. means it's picked and it's put on a truck. Um, yeah. Then it's charged just right before the truck goes out the, you know, heads out of the dock. That way, you know, we have random weight things like you mentioned cheese and and meats and stuff and so we get exactly what's on your order and charge you correctly whereas you know and the other nice thing about that is you know if you want to check out early you won't accidentally forget to char check out before the uh cutoff and you can change your order you can add things delete things change quantities do all that stuff for um you know, right up until the cutoff. And we even give about two hours grace after that. If you call us up after cutoff, we have about two hours that we can, during that two hours, we're actually managing the, tr we're splitting the trucks and stuff, figuring out how much goes on each truck and making sure we get the right shuttles and all that because we have the weight. But even after that, if you need to, um, during the two hours, we're negotiating the truck weights and stuff we still have, there's a little bit of grace time to be able to uh, call us and make changes if you absolutely have to. 
Well, I did uh, on mine. I went ahead and checked out this past month, and I would, as I would think of things, I'd go look and search and throw them in the cart. And um, I really like that part about it too, because that way I don't forget. When I think of something, I go add it to it, and it's already ready to be paid for at the end of the month or when the cutoff date is. And the other thing is, if somebody wanted to become a coordinator, it's very simple. They they contact you and they have a thing they fill out and things like that. Um, I know a lot of people say that there are spots to pick up or sometimes anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half or more away from them. And if they're if they wanted and they had other people in their area they can become a drop coordinator. There is a few requirements, but they y'all have a, a list on your website. If they think they could get enough people to have another drop that was closer to them instead of them having to drive an hour, hour and a half away, right? Yeah, absolutely. And almost all the drops have been developed that way. So we're happy to add new drops. We do all the time. Um, sometimes they're not even that far apart. Um, you know, they just get a little bit too big and cumbersome or they, you know, sometimes there's very uh, marked philosophical differences that people will start their own drop because they don't want to deal with those. But if you want to start your own drop, as long as we can get a semi in there and you have enough into the location and mm -hmm. there's enough, um, you know, people interested that it, there's a reasonable expectation that we're going to have, you know, a few thousand dollars worth of product there. Mm -hmm. um, and that depends on how far we have to drive. Yes. But, and that, that is the, the key point. If, if you have a drop spot in your area that can stay close to a highway you're already traveling, it makes makes it easier on y'all to coordinate it and it won't co cost them as much because... Yeah, if, we don't have to have a smaller, we don't have to have as large of minimum order. Yes. Uh, if it's way out, smaller, if yeah. way out in the podunk area, we would have to have larger amount yeah. uh, ordered to be able to justify getting the truck that far you know, out, especially if it's a one way and we can't do a loop of some sort. Yes, that makes sense. Um, well, David, I, have a, I appreciate it. I would love to come to Oregon and see what y'all have going on up there. Well, um, you're absolutely welcome to come if you. Uh... It, would, it would be a wonderful trip because I'm, I'm fascinated already. Um, I've been on the website for the last three months, just scouring and looking through because we only have a Walmart and a Piggly Wiggly here. And so oh, our organic food is limited to slim to none. And so we were having to use things that we didn't particularly want to. And I would have to order from Amazon anything that I could get. And there again, you're limited to what Amazon gives you, which is limited to no information on what you're getting. And... I appreciate that y'all vet every item and each thing in in your thing. And when you think they've changed something, you go back and you pull an item if it doesn't meet your standards. And that is we absolutely do. In fact, I was just working on that today <laughs> where we have several items that we're having to uh, discontinue because of ingredient. Uh, yeah. Issues. So uh, that is a big deal to me as a consumer and in a world where things are getting you know, like you said the FDA has their um what is it called their um, grass list their generally grass. recognized as yeah, so yeah. they have this minimum that they say you can put into things and I'm not okay with that that doesn't matter to me I don't want things that I don't need in my food in my food or my drinks or anything else. So I appreciate Azure for that and for you being steadfast in keeping your standards at Azure as high as you can keep them and keep our food safe. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. And hey, it's been wonderful, wonderful talking with you, Wanda. All right. I, well, I appreciate it, David. Thank you. Thank you guys for stopping by. There's a link in the description for Azure Standard and in the pinned comment. See you guys next time.